Good afternoon. We're at what, 2.08, so I'll try and not take up too much of your time. Um, again, uh, my name is John Tomaszewski. Because of my last name, you can call me JT. I'm the Africa Regional Director for the International Republican Institute. Um, in that role, I work in about 17 Sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and parliamentary strengthening is a, is a key element of what we do. Um, personally, as, as somebody who's not just worked here in Washington, I've also worked in places like Kenya, where I've made very good friends with my senator over here. Oh, it's good to see my friend here today, um, and always very keen, uh, given my relationship with Kenya, uh, to see you here. And um, But other places where we work, we're starting up a program right now in Ethiopia, so I noting that Ethiopia is here. Um, where I think some key things will be, of course, looking at the 2020 elections, um, but certainly parliament is going to be key, not just in electoral reforms, but in other elements to include security sector reform. In Ghana, uh, we've done a lot of work with NDI and IRI doing stuff with related to the elections, but of course we're also engaged there. Um, it's note of note in Sierra Leone, we'll be releasing another public opinion survey which actually, which actually looks at some of the security issues. So uh, be keen to connect with someone from there. In Uganda, we've worked there for 20 years. And um, uh, we do know from Uganda has a very strong and proud parliamentary history in terms of its structure. You have a very strong speaker. You have a very strong sort of oversight mechanism. And it's a well-resourced, as is Kenya, which has probably one of the best budget offices on the continent. And uh, there's been a great deal of investment on the part of the U.S. Congress through the House Democracy Partnership to really resource and build the staff and the resources of that budget office. So one, you should connect with the Kenyan colleagues to see how that uh, plays into, of course, the money side of it. Um, but then more broadly, uh, how that is something that you might be able to adopt. Um, in Somalia, right now, uh, we're actually beginning parliamentary support work. And that is kind of tricky given the security situation, but the security committee in that country, the oversight, the role of parliament is a difficult one, um, but it's something that we're very active in. In Benin, we've actually done a lot of parliamentary exchanges. So Benin's actually been a place where we've taken Central Africans, where we've taken the Malians um, to really do a lot of exchanges and engagement. Um, in Mali, it's interesting, we finished the project where we worked actually with security folks and staff um, to actually help digitize archives. It's actually interesting if you go to a number of these parliaments, and I've been to a few of yours. Um, I mean, I remember when I went to, uh, to Mali and met with some of the heads of the commissions and went into the records rooms, they were just stacks of paper. Uh, you can't run a security oversight function when all of the reports and all of the things that are coming from the military are just pieces of paper, unorganized, sitting in a room. So we've helped them to take that information, digitize it. It actually isn't very expensive, it isn't hard to do. But as you think about ways in which you can make your job easier, it's to really work with the staff to find easy solutions to digitize your work. Um, it's really important. And then of course, um, a number of other countries here. Uh, I think the first uh, sort of thing I really will talk about is, is the role of, of, of parliament, but also security committees and the security sector in terms of preserving the democratic process. Chris and I uh, just came back from Nigeria where um, we watched as uh, the second round of elections in that country, um, the security got a little bit too involved uh, in the process, particularly at the polling units. And then um, as you went and saw the collation of results. Um, in Kenya, you may have a technology problem with the transmission of results. But in Nigeria, you have a problem with the military helping to collate results, or certainly pressuring those who have the results in hand. Um, so what will the National Assembly do, this very large and expensive body that the Nigerians have uh, to do the work? There'll be some questions asked. Um, but the boundaries between the defense forces, the security forces, security policy, um, are often balances and boundaries that are very loose um, in a number of your countries. And it creates a serious problem. And then, of course, your role as a parliament. And we know that, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, that your role as a parliamentarian could be as little as not much. Um, you don't have a lot of authority. Maybe you exist in a state where the party is the ruling party and it's the dominant party and you speak out against those people, you won't be running again, even if you don't end up getting into a car accident or something like that. We know how that plays out. 
The other issue that comes up with regards to uh, parliaments is um, no matter what you do, the executive will do what they want. So you make a statement on the floor, you call for an investigation, they'll just ignore you. We know what those ministers do. You call them down, they send some clerk or some small person shows up and doesn't give you much answers. Or in fact, they show up, but they don't answer your questions and frankly don't care what you have to say because they'll just go to the president and uh, c collapse the authority and do what they want in the end. And that can be very frustrating uh, as parliamentarians. You know, you come with a sense of duty. Uh, you. I assume, have read your constitution, so therefore you've read your roles and responsibilities, and you understand the mandate of your institution. The problem with that is uh, it's often hard to exercise that, and uh, it's a challenge that you run into from the very first day of your job. The other challenge, of course, even in the security sector is um, while you may want to focus on very important issues of national security, defense, and all of those very important things, at the end of the day, you turn on your cell phone after the session, and you've got 30 requests for money from your constituency, people needing help, uh, people wanting more from you than you can give. Um, so to even think about having a discussion about national security policy, you have a hard enough time justifying how you can go back to your constituency when you don't have enough money in your pocket to even travel back because you've given it all for funeral arrangements and, 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 and weddings. And the reason why I say this is because we can talk big picture and what's written down in paper, but what we really see on the ground is a very difficult scenario, a very difficult uh, challenge that parliamentarians are faced. So I'll try to be very, I'll try to be as practical as possible as I get into this. Um, certainly the number one, the number one problem of all people that I engage with that work in parliaments on the continent is you actually don't know your role. You think you know your role, you've read the Constitution, maybe you've skimmed over those standing orders, but the importance of really grasping the rules and understanding that um, is the most important uh, role that you're gonna have in, in really getting to the point of what power is bestowed upon you under the Constitution, what power you can really exercise, and figuring how to get those margins closer and closer together. The Constitution will tell you that you can call witnesses, but we know they won't show up. So then what are, what are the strategies that you can undertake? The Constitution maybe tell you, or the standing orders maybe can tell you that there are certain procedures that your committee can use to, to engage the government on security policy. But in reality, no one's going to listen to you. So who do you engage in civil society? What are the part, what are the workarounds that are needed? And these are some of the big challenges that come out of that. The second piece of this um, hones in on particularly the committees that you work on. Um, we, we like to see people speaking in plenary. We like to see you talking on your floor. Uh, I'm always amused by those parliamentary watchdog groups in your respective countries who remark about those three or four politicians who have been in parliament for four or five years. They've never spoken once on the floor. So certainly you should be speaking and making speeches. But where you really need to be doing your homework is at the committee level. So one, it's really pushing out the definition of what that committee is. Um, when we engage, I'll give you an example. We recently engaged with the Security Committee in the Gambia. And we're talking about a parliament that's the size of 56 people. And they're not paid a lot, by the way. They're paid on average about $500 a month. They don't have generous allowances like some of my brothers and sisters here uh, in terms of cars and staff and everything. So they ask questions, what can we do? jamay has gone, we were the rubber stamp institution. The Chinese built our building. They don't, we don't have anything other than this building. Uh, we don't have a staff. What do we have as national sovereignty, as a, as, a, as a parliament, to really contribute? So one, it's really helping them to reorganize the way that their committees work. Being a more efficient body so that when you sit down together, you can actually discuss problems is important. One thing that we've talked to the Gambians about, and we, I would urge you to do as well, is to go into your standing orders, go into your rules of engagement in the parliament, and see ways in which you can further define what it is you do. See ways in which you can sort out the jurisdictions between what the Foreign Affairs Committee does, what you do, how you're engaging maybe with the intelligence sector versus how another committee might be engaging with them. And the better that you can define those pieces, that'll be more helpful later when you propose legislation, when you hold hearings, if you do, and ways in which you can talk to uh, the executive with greater authority. Um, of course, the next piece of it that comes into it uh, deals with the issue of um, 
you know, really working on a strategic plan and something that we've worked with the Gambians on and we worked most recently with the Central African Republic uh, with a number of uh, commissions there is your committee needs to have a strategic plan. Now, I know my friends from Kenya the best because I'm married to a Kenyan and uh, I've worked in Kenya for quite some time. They love strategic plans. The problem with Kenyans is they always have a plan and a committee and they've done a lot of retreats to talk about that. But it's the implementation of the plan that will become a challenge for maybe a Kenyan parliament instead. And that has a lot to do with the fact that you write it all down, but then you have to do it. So it's important that if you do go through a planning process where you're looking at, okay, what is it the committee wants to uh, you know, achieve over the next year, three years, five years, and how are we going to do it? Um, of course, you're going to mark your strategic plan up against the budget cycle. You're going to mark your strategic plan up against specific reporting requirements of the executive. And certainly, you're going to make sure that your strategic plan is resourced. Now, resources are slim and bare in many of your parliaments. So who are the staff? How do we empower them? How do we give them more, more authority than just, you know, filling out the Hansard and filling out documents? How can we get them engaged in the process and invest in them so that they can do some of the work for us? When possible, how do we engage with specific audiences, right? So if you are in the security sector, how are you, um, through your strategic plan, engaging, let's say, with private security? And we know in many of your countries, the private security industry is a very large employer, um, but also has um, several questions that come up, right, in terms of the, the, the work in which they do, how they're regulated, and the oversight functions, and even sometimes the way in which the government gives them money. Um, so looking at these different partners and companies and engaging with them and using that through a real active outreach project. Um, I think the other really key issue deals with making sure that your committee is covering all of the issues in depth. So you've got defense, you've got intelligence, You've got actually economic security. So what is it that your specific committee is dealing with from the financial side in terms of the country, right? Territorial security, so dealing with issues like the border. I'm sure my Kenyan friends and my Somali friends can have some great discussions about border security, right? Where you have a border fence or a wall actually going up. Um, there's a lot of discussion that can occur there. You have challenges in places like Mali and Niger where the border is quite open. And how do you sort of secure that? So you're going to get into a lot more than just nuts and bolts, what's the military doing, and what are some of the other things. So really thinking through what are some of the sectors and areas, aviation, maritime security, industry, right? right? Um, making sure that the intelligence services are making sure that there aren't people coming and taking your intellectual property, right? Foreign affairs, these are all things that have security implications. The other thing that you need to know about is that uh, you, you will pound on the table about national sovereignty when the rules apply to you, but you don't want to follow them. Well, it's good to know what the rules are. So what are all the international treaties? You may be surprised that your foreign affairs minister and your defense minister is signing you up for security cooperation agreements, whether it's ECOWAS, SADC, and others. There are all kinds of agreements that you're probably signed up to that you probably don't know about. And you think you might know, but there's obviously many more. And so it's very important to do a deep dive. Understand what are some of those treaties. You will often find, as we find in many countries, that countries have signed these things, but they have not activated the relevant legislation to heavily make, actually make them law, make them realized. So what are the benefits of signing that treaty, and how can you act quickly? I mean, these are things, this is like low-hanging fruit I'm giving you. If you want your work list, this is like the first thing. Go back and look at some of these documents and really engage at that level. I think another thing that really comes into this um, deals with how to make your committee more effective. So I'll give you some more ideas here, all right? First, um, your subcommittee structure. So I was very interested when uh, Mena and I went to go do an assessment through the House Democracy Partnership of the Nigerian National Assembly. Um, Having dealt with Kenya, having dealt with Tanzania, Uganda, um, it was amazing to me to find out that the Nigerians had 92 committees. 92. Why do they have 92 committees? Because everyone gets a car, everyone gets three extra staff, and, right, we know with Nigeria, the federal character requires everyone to get something. So everyone's got to get a committee from a political zone. Everyone's got to get a committee from a state. Everyone has to get a committee from an ethnic body, right? So the issue of diversity drives the overabundance of committees. Well, it's important that um, while 
how, of course, your speaker and the leadership of your of your parliament are dealing with those issues of political balance and certainly that diversity, the other side of the, of the equation is effectiveness. So when you're setting up committees, uh, making sure that your subcommittees are relevant. So you need to have a subcommittee that deals with budget. You must. If the defense, if the defense or security committee does not have a dedicated budget committee, that's the first order of business. The second one deals with the issue of procurement. Don't put the two together. Figuring out the money and then spending the money should be two separate worlds, especially when it comes to the issue of acquisition of military equipment, acquisition of certain contracts, maybe for electronic and financial developments of how money is managed, right? All this stuff about procurement. The other element, of course, is personnel. And there's a lot we can talk about in terms of personnel. Personnel welfare, um, a number of countries deal and struggle with issues where pers military personnel you know, basically aren't being paid or not being housed correctly. We haven't even gotten into the gender question, um, really with women in the military and women, uh, certainly are they having a seat at the table and it's not just seat with their support structures, but are they actually engaged in theater? Are they actually doing things outside of just sort of the, the tasks that someone would deem relevant for them? So making sure that the personnel side of the subcommittee is looking at it. And then frankly, as we're seeing in the case of Uganda, Kenya, um, there's a number of West African countries is the issue of other peace missions or international missions. So you're always, whether it's G5, whether it's issues of Amazon, right, these different missions in which you're tr contributing troops. And we know the reasons why you're contributing troops are not just about always security. Sometimes they're political, sometimes they're nefarious, sometimes they deal with a number of other issues within a military structure or in a government structure um, that requires benefit, influence, foreign policy. Um, you need a committee that just looks at that on a constant basis and raises those questions, or subcommittee, sorry. Um, the other thing that really is key here is um, the issue of national security policy. So it's interesting that you'll find, uh, and we actually just saw this debate take, out, take place in Nigeria where the two presidential candidates provided competing visions of national security policy and how national security works. As a committee, you should be asking the executive, do you have a national security policy? And if they say, yes, we have a policy, read our party manifesto. No, that's not a policy. Or yes, we have a policy, look at some of the documents and legislation we've given you. That's not a policy. A national security policy is an all-encompassing document that looks at the big picture, that lays out the strategic vision, and ways in which that vision will be, will be executed. So it would be really important for you to really think about ways in which you can engage on that. Um, there are four phases of national security policy development. First one is really the development process, right? Um, the parliament should play and probably will play a limited role in that, but you should be demanding from your minister of defense, your ministers who are dealing with intel um, and other oversight uh, functions that you have and ministries that fall underneath um, about what their plan is and have them put that in sort of a concise document. And then, of course, you should, as parliament, eventually take custody of that document and have your own time to do that. Now, this is where the limits of your work come in, right? Because if the party has blessed it or the president has blessed it, you may not have the opportunity to make too many amendments. I don't see the South Africans here, but I just want to switch real quick because of this challenge. Also exists in South Africa. Did you know that South Africa's parliament not one time since the ANC has taken power in that country have they ever amended a budget put forward by the president. Not one time. And this isn't a country we think democracy has taken root, it's a strong institution, but imagine the parliament is so tied to the party and the structure of the executive that it has not offered an alternative budget since taking power. So it's something to think about that these challenges exist not just in um, a country that is you know, let's say still in more fragile stages of, of democratic development, but also in places like South Africa, which some say are, you know, more advanced democracies, right? But these challenges are there. Um, the next pl place that I think you should look into this, of course, when you're dealing with national security policy is to look at the issues of oversight and audit. And that really needs to be across the board. Now, what's interesting about audit bodies, and we're working on this in Gambia right now on this fiscal transparency work, is that you have auditors and auditors have a job to do and they will give you lots of information. The audit will come back to you and it'll say, 
the receipts given do not have appropriate documentation. Therefore, I don't know, 20 billion Naira is missing from the receipts. And the report tells us that it's missing. But that's where it ends. No one asks where the money went, what happened to it. Maybe there's a two-day news story, but it moves on to the next thing. It'll be important for you, and these are things you can do right now. If you have the will, if you have the desire, if you're not just worried about re-election, but also want to get done on the job, take an audit report and dig your teeth into it. And certainly, security, budgetary spending is some of the most interesting stuff um, in a country where budgeting is a challenge, you know? And so you will find issues of, you shouldn't ask that question as national security. You will find issues where you don't have the classification. You will find issues where, why are you asking this? It's not your role. Because people in the military will think and will believe that it's not your role to ask those questions. Audits are an important place to look at that. Um, and that's why national security strategy would be good because you can always refer back. You can say, you've put this in your strategy. You've funded this strategy. Yes, we are, you know, we still have to pass the budget because the government will get mad. We've passed this budget, but now the money's disappeared. So now what? Let's talk about this. This is ridiculous. And so engaging on that will be really important. I think the next thing, of course, um, in national security policy is really look at this issue of assessment and lessons learned. It'll be real important for you in any work that you're doing to really put the appropriate assessments out there. Um, and I think what you're doing here in terms of the U.S. with some benchmarking, but also in your respective countries. I mean, I actually think here is great and you'll learn a lot, but what you really need to be doing is to walking away from this experience by actually thinking of, I don't want to go see uh, Senator Susan in Mombasa to go and benchmark. I actually want to go to the Central African Republic and see how they're dealing with private Russian military contractors. I want to go to Somalia and see how they're working with issues of insecurity and working with a multinational force like Amazon. I want to go to Mauritania to see how they're working with their national CVE strategy. Right? You, you're we're going to learn more from each other than you will here in Washington and certainly um, from Congress because Congress has its own unique ways. There are things that we do well, but as you will say to me before I say it to you, African democracy has its own character and certainly you will learn more from each other on that. Let me just go back to the budgets really quick. Some of the challenges to budgets in the security sector. First, um, it's hampered by secrecy and, 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 and it's opaque. It's something that you don't really see. So a key thing if you're a parliamentarian working on a committee like this, you need to be asking for specific line items, right? You often have a budget that's linked to a program or a budget that's linked to something else within legislation. You want to see specific accounts and you want to push that through and you want to be engaging on that, not just during the budget making process, but once that money is funded, going back to that account, going back to that line item and making sure one, that that money's there and two, if it's there, how it's being spent. Um, I think the second piece of it is you, when you're dealing in the issues of security sector, if you're already frustrated as a parliamentarian because the president runs over everything you do or the ruling party cracks the whip on you and tells you what to do, is that certainly when you're dealing with money and the defense sector, the executive reigns supreme. And they, they often will tell you that and have a lot of control in telling you what is needed to defend the country. Um, it'll be important for you to find allies outside of that structure. Uh, both inside, but certainly outside. So who are the groups that can provide effective oversight? There's a lot of work done in civil society looking at defense. There's a lot of, ish a lot of work that's done at the international level in terms of uh, organizations like IRI and NDI. Um, there are a lot of chances to do that. And then finally, I would say on the issue of, of, of budgeting, um, really getting to know the budget cycle. Um, I find with a lot of parliamentarians that we work with is that you, you have challenges in terms of the budget cycle sort of not falling into your planning. This goes back to the strategic plan, but it also goes back to what you are putting forward as your priorities. If you know that the budget is due in, in June, but you haven't heard anything about the budget, um, let's say you know three or four months out, how are you engaging and making sure that that information is getting to you? It shouldn't be a secret, but it often is. So uh, there's a lot to talk about. I could talk for another two hours, but I won't. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, JT.